When you get CPU overload messages, audio dropouts and glitches when mixing in your DAW, the problem isn't that your computer's processing power is maxed out or that it's time to upgrade to a newer machine. The issue is that you never actually learn how to develop proper session management skills when mixing. Believe me, I've been there and things will only get worse as you start working on more complex projects with increased track count and bigger session size that will demand even more from your current system. Especially if you're working heavily produced music like EDM, modern rock, pop, metal, or even cinematic music that has tons of layers and instruments. Here's the thing, you don't need a new computer. The tips and hacks that I'm about to show you will solve the issue of your computer's own limitations, drastically freeing up CPU power and potentially saving you from spending thousands of dollars on a new machine. This step-by-step -step guide applies to all DAWs and works for both Mac and PC, so it really doesn't matter what type of system you're using. And you'll want to stick around until the end where I'll reveal one game-changing mixing hack that can revive an old computer or that can unleash even more DSP for your current system. Before anything else, the first thing we'll need to address is select the right buffer size. So we'll go here in Cubase, in Studio, Studio Setup, and then Control Panel. And here we'll select the highest buffer size available. When it's time for recording, you can go with a lower buffer size to actually reduce latency. But when it's time for mixing, you want to make sure to select the highest buffer size available to give your CPU the most amount of time to process the data. If your buffer size is too low and your demand on your system is too high, you will experience audio dropouts, glitches, and sometimes if a session is really heavy, you won't even be able to start the playback. One quick power tip here, if you still need to record on an existing session loaded with plugins and with high latency, what you can do is create a proxy session. So a new session with only printed stems imported into it, then you record whatever you need, keeping the same time reference, and then you can re-import in your session the newly recorded tracks so that way you won't have to deal with latency and you make sure that everything's properly done. Number two, make sure to set your hardware and project sample rate to 44.1 kilohertz as there is not really any gain you're gonna experience to set your project to really high sample rates like 192 kilohertz compared to 44.1 kilohertz. Just because the option of having a high sample rate is available doesn't mean you should do it. First, your project is gonna be much larger in size. Second, each time you're gonna load a plugin, the CPU load will be higher. So using a project at 44.1 won't make an audible difference. If you're choosing higher sample rates in your project because you're scared of aliasing, just know that many new plugins out there offer the oversampling function which will mitigate the Nyquist effect in your mixes. So just pick a lower sample rate and choose the oversampling function when needed. The number one reason why mixers hit DSP overload in their mixing sessions is the fact that they overlook the DSP usage of each plugin they are loading. If you'd be starting a diet today, you would start counting the calories in each of the meals that you're eating. Well, it's the same when you're loading plugins in your sessions. You should be aware of the DSP usage of each plugin. So Upon loading a plugin, just keep an eye on that meter to actually start to get a ballpark idea of what kind of resource this plugin is demanding. You would be surprised to see some plugins can actually take 5 to 10% of your CPU in only one instance. And if the meter is not there on your window, make sure to add it in the settings. The CPU usage of a plugin should be a really important criteria to consider when you're trying out a demo for a new plugin that's been released. And also, if you're updating versions from one older plugin to a newer version, for example, the Isotope Trash 2 plugin is very light on your computer. Recently, I updated to Trash 3, which is the re-release of Trash 1, and I can tell you that it takes about 10 times more resources as Trash 2. CPU usage for a plugin should be one important criteria to consider when you're trying out a new plugin before buying it. One of the best tips I can give you is to try to identify the culprits in your mixing sessions, putting the biggest burden on your CPU you and to try to find alternatives for them. Some plugins take very little CPU usage, whereas others, they can drain up to 10% of your CPU usage, especially when we're talking about mastering plugins or dynamic plugins 
or intelligent plugins that are actually making micro decisions all the time behind the scenes. It's good practice in your mixing workflow to have a ballpark idea of how much DSP each plugin is using. So that way you can prioritize plugins with bigger CPU usage for tasks that are more important. Let's say bus processing or two bus processing, whereas you can use plugin with lower DSP usage for single tracks. For example, if you're using a mastering grade limiter just for a single track, let's say Ozone 11 on the bass track, maybe you would gain from using something lighter like DMG track limit on the bass track only and keep that DSP power for bus processing or two bus processing. As any type of software developer, audio plugin developers want to make the most out of their program, so newer versions tend to always be bigger in size and take more DSP. CPU usage of the software we're using, such as plugins and virtual instruments, tend to follow the same trend as the development of the hardware. So if you're constantly updating software and you're using the same machine, eventually you're gonna be left behind. That's where it gets very important to be aware of the DSP load of the stuff you're using in your DAW. One of the most common culprits in your session for high DSP usage are reverbs and delays. So keep an eye out for these guys. The two ways to fix that first would be to load that plugin on that single track where you want the effect and freeze the track or print it. Second, you can route all the tracks that need to have this effect on and send it as an auxiliary bus or a send bus and load that plugin only once on that effects bus itself. Three very important things regarding plugin. First, if you're not using a plugin, but it's still in your session, don't just bypass it. You have to either remove it or deactivate it. For example, in your session in Cubase, you can click option, click, and this will deactivate the plugin because when bypass, there is still a little bit of DSP being used. Next, if there are some specific features that you're not using in the plugin, make sure to turn them off. For example, if you're talking about the specific EQ from Waves, make sure that if some bands are not being used, for example, here, band two and three, four are not being used. So turn them off because each of them is taking a little bit of DSP. Same thing goes for modular plugin such as Slate VMR. If you're not using certain modules here, better to simply remove them. Also, be very careful when you're using oversampling features and plugins because of the additional DSP usage. For example, FabFilter Saturn. Some plugins like Oxan Soothe 2 actually have different settings we can use for oversampling depending if it's real time or offline. So you can bump the oversampling rate higher for offline processing and keep your session a bit lighter. Dynamic and intelligent EQ plugins such as Sunnable Smart EQ4 are awesome, but they also tend to take more DSP because they're making micro decisions all the time behind the scenes. So that is a factor to consider when you're loading all these plugins throughout your mix. If you're working on an older system, it's probably a good idea to work a little bit more on automating plugin parameters than relying on these AI powered plugins. Remember that everything is a trade-off between computer resources, time and energy. And if you rely too much on these AI plugins to run in real time and make decisions for you, this will put an additional burden on your computer. Instead of loading three plugins, let's say a compressor, a gate, and an EQ on a specific source like a kick drum, it's probably a better option to load a channel strip, let's say SSL channel strip, that can do all that at once. So all these functions aggregated in one specific plugin will take usually less DSP load than loading three different plugins to do the same job. One pitfall of modern mixing is the sheer amount of options and possibilities at our fingertips, and it's really easy to get lost in this overabundance of options. So back then, they had only a specific amount of gear, and they had to physically purchase it. So that took actual space in the studio. So one really important thing to remember is that over-processing won't necessarily help your mix. It can actually be a detriment to your mix. It's much more important to learn the tools that you already have than to just buy a bunch of plugins on the marketplace and cross your fingers that your mix is gonna sound better. You can give a great guitarist a crappy instrument and it will still sound pretty good. But if you give a newbie the best thing out there, it will still sound like crap. The same goes for plugins and mixing. 
With large projects such as this one, it's a common approach among mixers to route individual tracks to sub buses or groups and then do the processing on those groups instead. For example, when you're mixing orchestral instruments such as perks, brass, winds, and so on. So if most of your processing is done on sub buses rather than individual tracks, you may run into trouble if you're trying to have dynamic processing going on. Let's say sidechain compression between certain buses because this type of processing has to be running in real time. You cannot commit those buses if they're interacting in your mix and then send to your two bus. So the advantage of doing most of your processing on your single tracks is that you're going to be able to free the DSP by printing, committing or freezing those tracks and then the signal is going to be sent to your sub bus and then you can do the minimal amount of processing there. So the dynamic processing won't take as much DSP on your computer and you're going to be able to work with really large sessions. Nowadays we use a lot of virtual instruments in our productions and we tend to leave them active in the sessions so that we can go back to them and change them as we want. But these take a lot of resources. So make sure that once you reach the desired result, you can freeze those tracks or print them so they won't be running in the background. One very important thing regarding plugins, don't be afraid to use stock plugins that come free with your DAW. Nowadays, most of those stock plugins are really great. For example, in Logic and Pro Tools and Cubase. So you can do a lot of work with that. And they're made specifically for your DAW, so they have usually much lower CPU usage. Since it's very complicated nowadays to upgrade computers after you bought them from the store, one really good tip is to purchase a secondhand DSP accelerator card, such as the UAD satellite. So basically, this can extend the life of your computer. You should also prioritize using CPU heavy plugin from that external DSP accelerator card. That way, if you're starting to run out of DSP, so you can freeze your single channels and leave these plugins running on your buses in real time without affecting all the rest of your session. One final step to overcome CPU overload would be to do a clean form format of your system. Start with a clean slate that gets rid of all the gunk of the previous installation, application and operating systems that basically can still carry over some background processes that may be taking its toll on your CPU. Let me know if all these tips help you by dropping a comment below and show some love by smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. And if you want to learn a ton of other tips and hacks on how to optimize your Mac specifically for audio production, check out this video. I really hope to see you there.